we're now ready to talk about how you can retrofit your home to make it warmer without warming the earth in the process. Our first guest this evening is Emma Wayman. Emma was recruited by the city last year to be our community climate champion. You may have seen her wonderful presentation to the PCA's annual general meeting where she introduced the idea of a pocket laneway project. Emma is currently finishing her master's in environmental studies at York University. Uh, she'll give us an introduction to the climate crisis and explain what's happening to our world. Welcome, Emma. Thank you, David. Um, I'm just going to try and share my screen here. Do, do, do. Okay. All right. Can everybody see that? Maybe give me a thumbs up. Okay, cool. And Okay. All right. Um, so hello, everyone. Uh, as David said, my name is Emma. And for the last several months, I've had the wonderful opportunity to work with David um, of the Pocket Change Project and learn all about some of the amazing initiatives going on here in the neighborhood. Uh, tonight, I'm going to talk about some of the reasons why energy retrofits are such a key endeavor for us to tackle in 2022, uh, not only to create a net zero neighborhood, but also to slow and mitigate the effects of global climate change. So where to start? <laughs> As an environmental stu studies student, I have the great privilege of hearing and thinking about the climate crisis every day, which is a lovely and cheery subject, uh, especially paired with the global pandemic. As such, I'm quite familiar with how overwhelming it can be to try to figure out the best ways to reduce your carbon footprint and live more sustainably. Whether it be through the transportation you take, the food you buy or grow, where you buy your clothing, the companies you support, or the energy that you use, there are tons of issues to address and not the greatest window of time to accomplish it all. So you might ask, why focus on energy? So here's a bit about the big picture. <laughs> the most IPCC report, or the most recent IPCC report, states that we need to reduce our global greenhouse gas emissions to net zero in the next two decades, uh, in order to avoid severe and irrevocable increases in global temperature, which sounds very ominous. The impact of global warming is already becoming increasingly apparent and closer to home, as I'm sure a lot of us witnessed uh, this past summer with all the wildfire smoke, as well as the flooding and heat waves in BC. It's all very apparent uh, and getting, it's increasing every day. So that's, there's a bit of urgency there in our need to act. When we look at our global emissions, energy through its production and use accounts for over two thirds of global greenhouse gas emissions. And that's a lot. <laughs> Therefore, energy needs to be at the top of our to-do list in order to meet our climate goals. So here in Toronto, we have our work cut out for ourselves. Though we love our changing seasons, this also means higher emissions from both heating and cooling our homes each year. Energy for homes and buildings continue to produce 60% of our city's greenhouse gas emissions. That's more than our vehicles and our waste produce annually combined. Uh, this is largely due to the fact that most Toronto homes operate on oil and gas rather than electric or renewable energy sources. Though natural gas can often sound more innocuous than oil, my parents are always like wondering if it's actually okay because it has the word natural in it. Um, it actually is 70%, uh, it has 70% higher potential for warming than carbon dioxide. So it's actually a lot worse. Um, and it's easy to overlook because you don't really see it. It's not like seeing the exhaust from your car. It's kind of like the silent assassin or whatever you call it. Uh, so every time you're heating your home with gas or oil, you're also heating the planet. So this past year, the city of Toronto announced the Transform TO Net Zero Strategy, which aims to reduce our emissions by 65% by 2030 and achieve net zero emissions by the year 2040. So that is no small feat. And it's clear that in order to reach those targets, we need to get off the gas and oil and, trans and transition towards zero emission sources. Uh, some of the ways that we can begin is by encouraging our city councillors and leaders uh, to further green our electricity grids as more people transition to electric. Um, we can reduce our energy usage at home um, by doing, you know, unplugging your devices, using clotheslines in the summer, taking shorter hot showers, etc. Um, we can conserve energy through better installation and more efficient appliances. And the big one is to retrofit homes. And so that will be obviously covered further in the presentation. So I won't get into that right now. Now, I just wanted to briefly touch on this really scary and alarming photo. Oh, no. uh, but during, <laughs> not to scare what? anyone. No, but, mom? Yes. Oh, sorry, I hear a voice. 
Um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, there has been a significant drop in global greenhouse gas emissions, which is one of the silver linings on the pandemic. Um, however, we have also taken severe hits to our communities and to our economy, which is self-evident. But it's important to note that during the recovery period of the last financial crisis in 2008, the world saw one of the greatest increases in carbon emissions in human history. So that's pretty significant. Um, I think it's because in order to quickly recover, we try to find fast sort of solutions that aren't always best for the environment. So I just wanted to note that as we come out of these tumultuous times, um, we have a unique opportunity to make lasting change and to learn from our past mistakes and instead re-envision and transform our energy systems and really push for that when you're voting or whatever it might be um, to see those changes happen. Okay, so I'm almost done here. Uh, in looking at energy and the climate crisis, it is clear that sustainable energy is urgent as we need to act now before it is too late. Um, it is necessary and essential towards meeting our climate targets. And lastly, it is beneficial not only for the planet, but also for your wallet as you come to save on fuel that is very costly, uh, both financially and environmentally. So I hope I have given you a rough sense of why the focus on energy, on energy is so important right now and how creating more efficient, renewable and diversified home energy infrastructure can contribute to a more resilient and sustainable future. And I just wanted to thank you all for having me here and enjoy the rest of the presentation. Thank you guys. Oops. Thank you very much, Emma. I never have to know how to get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. That was wonderful. Uh, all right, uh, our next guest is Stuart Dutfield from the Environment and Energy Division at the City of Toronto, where he's now in charge of public energy initiatives for existing buildings. Welcome, Stuart. Hi, everyone. Hi, David. Thanks for having me, and um, and thanks, Emma, for the great sort of setup there. Um, it's um, it's it's good to be back here again. Again, I, I know. I'm trying to think back to the last time we actually saw each other in person, but you know, we won't we won't remiss too much on that. Um, so I've given this sort of presentation or variations of it a few times. So I'll, tr I'll try to blitz through it and, and rather try to leave some time for questions. Um, but uh, it is different from the one from the SNAP presentation, but uh, we'll start there. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to do a little bit of a, a quick deep dive on the, uh, actually, let me just share my screen here. Uh, sorry, folks. Um, So hopefully, so there we go. Um, so what I'll do is, um, again, I'll, I'll I'll build it on Emma quite really well light out. It's just basically the emissions profile. I'll talk a little bit about the existing building strategy, uh, just because it's, it's become our sort of guide for the work we're doing and all the work planning uh, we're in the process of um, advancing right now. And then I'll speak a little to the home uh, retrofit piece because I know that's the interest of this group. Um, but there, there's, you know, when we speak about homes, obviously there's, you know, rental accommodation and, um, you know, multi-unit. And so we do have some, we have some programs for that and we're hoping to launch some new ones this year. Um, so, you know, keep your, keep your eyes peeled for them. Um, so really quickly, again, I think this is a old hat for this group, but as Emma said, you know, basically 60% of our emissions are coming from buildings, which is, which is definitely the lion's share of this. 36% um, from transportation and the balance from waste. Um, of that 31%, um, you know, we're looking at about, sorry, of that 57%, about 31% of that is actually just coming from single family homes. So although small, they are extremely not numerous across the city, uh, more than 400,000 of them. So that adds up to quite, um, quite a big picture. Again, you can see here that, that residential is, uh, again, the single family and the uh, multi-unit residential. So what I like to do uh, with these presentations uh, is always try to give people a picture of what the report looks like. Because when we go to council, um, we essentially have a report that um, you know, is a big black and white document. So I like to put these up so everyone can understand that you know, there's a lot of technical analysis and modeling that goes into the reports and the recommendations we put before council. So what we did uh, in the summer is we brought forward the, the, the big plan for existing buildings because we recognize that given that they are this lion's share, we really have to do a deep dive. Um, so this is in response to the climate emergency. Um, at the same time, we also, uh, the city also brought forward its own corporate zero carbon plan for the city-owned real estate of which we have, you know, 
close to 1,500 buildings. Um, and the city planning division also brought forward its uh, TGS, what we call the Toronto Green Standard for new construction, which is ramping up the ambition uh, for what we built. So what the strategy intended to do is really like strike the balance between you know, speed and feasibility, um, because we know that doing this will be expensive uh, and challenging. Um, so the big considerations, obviously, were how do we reduce emissions, what are the economic implications of this, but really realizing the co-benefits around this. So resilience, and I think Emma spoke to this right as well, too. We've seen a lot of impacts from uh, extreme heat events, flooding, uh, et cetera. So health, equity, and, and the local economic development. And I think a lot of things about um, you know, climate action are inherently local, and so they generate local economic uh, opportunities. Instead of exporting money to pay for energy to bring it back in, you know, your, your manufacturing, your building, um, and these are, you know, skilled trades. There's jobs in trades, manufacturing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so um, what does the strategy really outline? Well, I would say three buckets of work, um, which will take us a better part of the next uh, 20 years. Um, so we outlined that we need to really set requirements to assess buildings performance and create that pathway to zero. Uh, we recognize that we need to start providing additional support and resources to make retrofits easier and more affordable and get to scale, and that we need to advocate and partner with other levels of government. Um, so, you know, I'm going to highlight a few here that I think will be relevant uh, to this group. So the first one under action to require annual emissions performance reporting and public disclosure of all existing buildings. Um, so this means essentially, you know, a label on, on a home or a building as to how much energy carbon it's producing. Um, and there's a lot of precedent uh, for this, um, also in the single family housing sector, so we'd be looking at home energy labeling and disclosure. Um, the other piece here is around, you know, providing that integrated retrofit support, so how can we help people through this process, uh, beginning to think about permitting and approval processes to support deep retrofits. And again, I think the incredible work this group has been doing with the neighbors in the pocket and you know, others that we've connected with over the last uh, year and a bit, um, there's this groundswell of neighborhood and community-led efforts to really, um, really advance some practical, pragmatic uh, projects uh, in the home and, and the building sector. And then again, I think there's huge opportunities around workforce development and training. Um, and of course, um, you know, the city, like, like uh, you know, members of communities, we really need to advocate to all levels of government for that, that, that funding support because um, the city alone is, is not going to have the money, so we're, we're definitely going to be knocking on the doors of those with bigger purses. Um, you know, we're not going to go into the slide in any detail, but, you know, this is just to say that we're going to start um, basically looking to introduce some of these measures on a voluntary basis uh, beginning this year and transitioning, uh, you know, to mandatory uh, around 2025. Um, what a number of people will also know from um, what happened uh, in December is that council actually um, upped the ambition. So where we were aiming for net zero by 2050, council said, no, we want to do it faster. So they actually adopted uh, the city's overall plan and said, let's, let's do it 10 years sooner. So we have a new target of 24, it's uh, net zero by 2040. Uh, Toronto is one of only three cities in the world that's doing this. And so we're also recalibrating um, as to how we do that. Like I said, uh, 10 years faster and we're 2022. So by my estimation, I think it was about 18 years. So we got to get busy. Um, you know, again, yeah, lots of words on the slide. I think the, the important thing to, to highlight really is that, um, you know, this is, needs to be a transition. And for most people, this will be a transition. Most people cannot go out there and retrofit their homes overnight. Um, for homes, you know, that I think are a similar vintage to those in the pocket, um, there's a lot of nooks and crannies. Uh, there's a lot of walls that, that plaster over lots of mistakes. I live in a house where I'm always discovering something and it's not necessarily a good thing. So, you know, it's around making that plan for that transition. Um, I think the important thing to consider too is, is given the stress on housing and housing affordability in the city, it's how do we also, you know, mitigate potential negative impacts on equity deserving groups. Um, I've listed out um, some of our programs here, both in our commercial, uh, the commercial side of our team, um, but I'm gonna kind of do a little deeper dive on some of the, the residential. So we do have the, the Better Buildings Partnership, which is a, our, our commercial uh, group, largely. Uh, we're running a, a few initiatives under that and, and hope to have another one launching soon. 
Um, so we have our energy retrofit loan program, so we can provide uh, low interest financing to commercial buildings, uh, to, to, you know, and housing and uh, at, at pretty good rates. Um, we have our Green Wool Initiative, which is targeting large portfolio owners or multiple buildings, um, and our navigation support services. And interestingly, we've had, um, we're working, we're now following up a number of people who've been reporting through our energy and water reporting benchmarking program, um, and are seeing more and more interest from small businesses actually coming into this. Um, you know, I think the opportunity around COVID recovery and some funding has been available. Um, I'm going to really hone in on uh, the Home Energy Loan Program today and, and some changes that have been made even in the last uh, three weeks um, after a report went to council. Uh, and just highlight, um, we do have our Better Homes Tier website and resources there. Uh, this year, there's going to be a big uh, focus on building out some of the resources there um, to make, you know, so I think begin to help people really understand this in a bigger way and, and what's going to be required of it. Um, so I won't get overly technical uh, because I'm, I'm not the technical guy on our team, um, but I would say, you know, what, what we're looking for is a transition over time to net zero. Um, again, I, I want to emphasize for most people that, you know, it's not going to be ready, steady, go. Unless you've just moved into a home and, you, you know, you've got some cash to do at reno or, um, you know, you win the lottery, it, a lot of this is going to have to be staged. Um, so you know, when you're doing a renovation, if you do a sort of light or similar, what we call a light or similar repla uh, replacement, so if you fix up your roof and your windows, um, if you just, you know, put in a slightly higher efficiency HVAC system, you change all the light bulbs, you'll probably get a, you know, 30% in, in, you know, decrease in emissions energy roughly. What we, you know, really need to be beginning to see is the light or similar, but with the fuel switch. Um, fuel switch is really where we're going to begin to see um, those emissions come down. And, and fuel switching is, as Emma quite rightly said, you know, getting off fossil fuel and transitioning to heating space and heating water with electricity. Um, and there's some, you know, we've got some great resources. Uh, we had a webinar at uh, the end of last year that was think, really good with a guy uh, just outside of the pocket, actually, um, who did it in his home. Uh, you know, he has the benefit of being a, an engineer who does this for the University Health Network, but he really breaks it down in the steps he went through. So long story short here, I think, you know, what we're looking to see is, you know, replacing the windows, the roof, insulation, the envelope of the building um, to decrease the need for, you know, heat uh, and air conditioning, and then begin that fuel switch. And then, you know, over time, obviously, you, you know, as people think about getting a switching from a in internal combustion engine, you know, to an electric vehicle, opportunities for solar, battery, et cetera. So with that, um, again, I've mentioned uh, uh, the program to a number of folks. Um, HELP is the city's home energy loan program. Uh, we are able to provide low interest loans to homeowners interested in energy efficiency, water conservation, and renewable energy work. Um, and um, we're, this, this is going to be it's going to be hopefully the year where we can get some long-awaited changes in place, um, but we have been priming those. So um, homeowners can borrow up to 10% of the current value assessment of their home uh, to a maximum of $125,000. So we recently changed this um, uh, through a report last year in anticipation of some funding we're hoping to get through SDM. Uh, so previously we were we were maxed out at about seventy five thousand. So now we're able to finance up to twenty one hundred twenty five thousand um, single family homes, detached, semi detached, duplexes, triplexes, all work. And one of the other changes we made last year is we are now able to support tax exempt properties from participating. So tax exempt properties are those that um, are often providing community benefits, so community living situations. So we're excited to see where we can go with that as well. One of the preconditions of the program, obviously, is that uh, folks get a home energy loan, uh, sorry, get an Energuide audit um, that's conducted by, you know, a registered auditor. Uh, we require both a pre and a post uh, audit. And we're in discussions with NLCAN too to really understand, um, you know, how we can make this easier. Um, I'll speak to this a little later, but there's, there's currently quite a shortage of uh, folks doing this right now because um, the federal government introduced a program, which has been great, 
uh, but there's been a huge demand on the on the federal government's uh, greener homes program. So again, really quickly, um, the loans are attached to the property, uh, not the owner, uh, through a local improvement charge mechanism, and are essentially uh, repayable via the property tax system. Um, the loans can be repaid at any time without penalty, or if the home is sold, um, you know, it can be assumed by the new owner. Um, the other thing about this is that um, while you, you know, we often issue initial disbursements, you're not paying interest on that until the project is completed and we finalize. So that's another, you know, nice thing that um, um, is kind of a, an acronym of this program. Um, so uh, how does it work? Um, essentially, the application comes in and we work with our revenue services group to do a tax and utility account verification. Basically, are you, you know, have people been paying on time? Um, if folks have a mortgage, we request uh, mortgage lender consent uh, and, and help coordinate that. And some of the banks we've been working with are getting faster at that and, and we now have a direct line to accrue of them. Um, and then we ought to issue a notice to proceed, um, you know, get your home energy evaluation, you plan the project. Uh, submit the funding request to us, get your quote. Again, we recommend people, you know, get multiple quotes. Um, you can sign a property owner agreement at that point, and then we're actually able to advance up to 30% of the project funding uh, once the work begins. Uh, you know, you get the project all wrapped up, um, and you submit those invoices to us, and that generally, uh, we generally turn that around pretty quickly. And, um, you know, once that's done, uh, we issue a check for the final amount of money. And again, you end up with this kind of sweet spot between the time the project is completed with us and when the uh, it's registered um, as, a, as essentially as a bylaw. So you get an additional two month, three interest rate period. Um, so obviously we cover a huge amount of things, insulation, mostly every type, uh, high efficiency uh, heat pumps, furnaces, air conditioners, uh, energy recovery, ventilators, windows, skylights, and doors, uh, water heaters, drain heat recovery systems, and efficient toilets. Um, Solar PV systems as well. Um, and one of the things I'll make note of here too is um, our colleagues at the city have actually been doing three uh, solar PV system assessments. Um, there's a new service that's available. It's a solar PV map. Um, so it will give you an estimate essentially of your home and you can just type in your address. Um, so again, we recommend that obviously, you know, if you're thinking seriously about it, you know, you'd go out and get a proper quote and, and double check that information. But it, it's good to give you kind of a benchmark. We can also cover the cost of uh, level two charges above and above. And again, you know, we, we try to emphasize this where we can heat pumps, heat pumps, heat pumps. Um, we're hearing really good things. And I think, you know, a lot of people are interested in that. So this is the other change um, I wanted to mention that is, is very recent. Um, so we switched the way uh, we are calculating our current interest rates. Um, as you can see here, these are pretty good rates. Um, so a five-year term at 1.78%, 10 years at 2.25, 15 at 2.67, and our 20-year term uh, at about 2.81%. Um, so th this, the, the asterisk really there is it's sort of limited to some key, uh, key stuff, so solar, windows, and geothermal, and heat pumps. Um, but I think these rates are super, com you know, super competitive, especially when you compare them to, say, uh, you know, a line of credit. Um, I'm going to skip over that. That's not very exciting. Um, the other thing we, we allow is for the loans to be stacked with other rebates. So Enbridge Gas currently um, has its home efficiency rebate. So that's up to $5,000. Um, and the rebate, again, has to go through the Energuide process. So if you're doing Energuide, it's best to you know, combine these things. Um, the other one I'm going to flag, a lot of people might know about, hopefully you've applied for, is Canada's Rena Homes Grant. These are grants with up to 50 cents. Um, they cover the cost of the Anaguide home evaluation, all the things we mentioned. Um, if you got your audit in up to December 1st, 2020, you can do that retroactively. Um, and again, it's important to um, complete a pre and a post audit. Um, the, the thing I will note here is I, I've applied for this myself and they are super backed up. So if you haven't, just get in the queue. Um, we got some high level information from NOCAN um, last year and it seems that um, I believe around more than 5,000 of these projects have been completed so far in Toronto. So um, it's, it's, it's a good result. Um, 
really quickly, and I can share this around, but you know, there's some good benefits out here, up to 5,000 for home insulation, 5,000 for heating and cooling. Um, the important thing here is that, you know, it is quite specific, um, the specification for key equipment. So definitely look into it and make sure, you know, if you're getting uh, someone to do this work, they understand the specifications that, that, that are needed. Um, the other thing is, is the thing I, I you know, I've probably told this group before, we, we are nearing a year since we, um, we, we FDM announced that we were the recipients of this funding, but we're still finalizing agreement. So um, we were awarded funding from the third iteration of Canadian municipalities to build out health and, and offer enhancements to the program, which we're, we are working on. Um, and, you know, I'd be happy to come back to this group and tell you a little more what those all uh, figured out. So this is um, the update with where we don't want to officially launch everything yet, but we've got the approvals as of December. Um, so in early Q2 of this year, the city will be launching an enhanced home energy loan program um, with additional offerings and an interest rate as low as 0%. Um, it will be applicable to new projects only. Um, so um, those, and we're anticipating this around Q2 of 2022. So um, please do check our website for the details on this um, and, you know, opportunities to learn more. So we're, because of COVID, we're also currently sort of, um, we're not doing a lot of, we're not, you know, doing a huge amount of marketing and outreach because, you know, the city's focus is on the COVID conversation and the COVID issues. Um, but as soon as we, we have a, an agreement finalized and, and we, we have more details on this, um, we will be uh, scheduling a series of webinars um, with, you know, community organizations uh, and, uh, you know, um, energy auditors, et cetera, to really get the, the word out in their program. And I think this is a group we'd love to come back to. Um, I am going to leave it there. And I'll just say thank you very much for, for having me once again. And, you know, I really appreciate all the great work the, the Pocket Change Committee are doing. And, um, yeah, I look, look forward to seeing what's happening next. Thanks, everyone. Well, thank you, Stuart. That was wonderful. Uh, a thousand questions. Um, and we'll come to those soon, those questions. Um, our final panelist for the evening is Sarah Grant from Goldfinch Energy. Sarah serves as retrofit advisor for our pocket change makers, and she'll explain what that means. Well, welcome, Sarah. Thank you. Get your questions ready, by the way. <laughs> Sorry about that. I shared it in the wrong format after all that. Okay, good. We're cooking, right? Can everyone see a picture of a very adorable mother and baby? Yes. Okay, great. This is my dear friend, Ashley Good. She moved into a home not too far from most of you on Monarch Park Avenue a few years ago, and um, their air conditioner broke the first summer that they lived there, and um, they chose to go for a heat pump instead of replacing it. So instead of going for like for like, as Stuart was saying, they opted for something that would reduce their home's reliance on fossil fuels on on that horrible misnamed um, fossil fuel called natural gas. And I wanted to start with that just to emphasize that, um, you know, we've heard a lot about the importance of retrofitting and how it fits into broader climate action and our homes in particular. And um, I, it's great to see everyone here and likely motivated to take climate action at home. And I also want to emphasize that um, when retrofitting your home, improving home comfort is something that goes hand in hand with retrofits. And um, I'm going to share a little bit more about the retrofit process, and particularly if you are interested in becoming 
a member of uh, the Pocket Change Project and a change maker as Lori and Michael are and a few others on this call. Um, and, uh, and, and, and speak a little bit more about how uh, that process can help reduce your home's greenhouse gas emissions. So I'm Sarah Grant. I am a energy advisor. I trained to become an energy advisor about two years ago, right at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, had a really fantastic opportunity to have a career shift and uh, started a business with a friend of mine called Goldfinch Energy. And our, you know, we saw the same thing that I think everyone here sees, the city sees, which is that you know we need to crack this tough nut of retrofitting our residential homes. And um, we want to make it easy, accessible, affordable, um, and successful. And uh, and I work alongside Paul, who probably many of you know as the friendly neighborhood retrofit coach, open for any and all questions. No bigger, too, no questions too big or too small. And um, you know, both of us are believe in sort of practicing what we preach. So we're both in the process of um, various retrofits on our own homes. Before I talk a little, oh, sorry, yep. Just, just on behalf of um, someone who has been with us from the beginning, um, she's wondering if you can make your slide full screen. It is not. Huh. Okay. Weird. I, I bumped it up to 150, it's now at 200%. Sorry about that. Okay, let me just, uh... I didn't realize it wasn't. <sighs> Someone says you're in notes mode, not presentation mode. Does that help you, Sarah? Is that better? Same? It's the same. Okay, I'm just going to restart the share. Ooh. Okay. Okay. I just sure. stopped. I just stopped it. I don't know. I'm, I'm not. Yeah, I opened it in notes mode by accident at the beginning. Okay. And, um, and we don't want to derail your presentation. Oh, no, I no, I, I apologize. That, if it's easy not... for you, great. Well, this might be the last time that I use Canva to. Um... Hey, wow. Better? OK, I don't know. Yeah. No. Second, time's a, second time's a charm. Apologies for that. OK, so before I talk further about um, the Pocket Change Project and being a change maker, and, um, I want to just pause and, and in case anyone isn't familiar with heat pumps, they've been brought up a few times. So uh, about for our homes, as far as emissions go, as you've heard, um, I like to think of the average Toronto home as about as bad as driving a gas guzzling vehicle, you know, the standard um, you know, 15,000 kilometers a year is pretty typical. So most of our homes are about as bad as maybe a mid-size, maybe if you have a smaller larger home is about as bad as an SUV. Some homes I've seen in Toronto are about as bad as two vehicles. Anyway, so just as fuel switching with our cars is occurring, um, fuel switching with our homes is, is equally as important. And uh, with, when it comes to getting our homes off of gas, about 80% of the emissions come from how we heat our home. And an air source heat pump for many homes, not all, is um, a great solution. So in case you're not familiar with how it works, you actually have this technology in your home already in the form of your refrigerator. And if you have an air conditioner, it's the same technology. So um, essentially outside air is sucked into the heat pump. Heat always wants to move to cool and the refrigerant then flows from an outdoor unit to an indoor unit. And um, heat is then circulated through the home um, it works exactly like an air conditioner. So in the summer, it's, uh, it's grabbing the heat from inside our house. And then in the winter, it's working in reverse. Um, they come in sort of a variety of formats. So this image right here is a ductless heat pump. So um, you might be familiar with some people who have ductless air conditioners or heat pumps on their third floor of their home, or if they have radiators and they're looking for a form of air conditioning. But they can also be connected to your ductwork. Um, there are models that are cold climate. So oftentimes, um, well, there still unfortunately is a bit of a myth out there that they don't work well in the winter. And I'm happy to share that 
uh, last year, my business partner and I worked with about 20 homeowners who got their homes off of gas for heating. And um, it was really nice to see over the last few weeks as the temperatures have gone down to you know minus 20 and below, many of them have just reached out to us to say, hey, just letting you know, our home has been perfect, no problems. And you know that's really nice because usually you hear when things are going wrong. But um, so a cold climate heat pump can actually work up to, some models can work up to minus 27. I've seen even specs showing even higher performance than that. So um, that as a myth, if someone tells you that they don't work in our winters in Toronto, not true. Um, there are models though that they're not as expensive and they're not rated to perform down to you know our sub-zero temperatures. And so with with the home that has um, has duct work, often you have a choice. You can go for a cold climate heat pump and heat your home entirely with with you know electrically powered heat pump, or if um, for, for a few reasons, you might choose to go with a dual fuel system where you would use the heat pump in the summer to cool and then in the spring and the fall to heat. And then when the temperature drops around zero or, you know, or so, depending, um, you would switch to heating with a gas furnace. And it's just like a hybrid vehicle. It's a sort of, you know, it's, it's a step in the right direction. It's not a step all the way, but um, for some homes, it's not necessarily possible to get all the way off of gas at this point. That's primarily because uh, heat pumps are sort of small to medium size, whereas gas furnaces and boilers are small to very large in size. So if you have a older, larger home that's uninsulated and fairly leaky, you might find that heating with the heat pump entirely just isn't feasible. You need some sort of backup source and um, you could use electricity as backup and you may be okay with that. It's very expensive, but it's off of gas or you could use a gas furnace. So, sorry, I just threw a whole bunch of terminology, but um, some of it I think is just important to understand and uh, at least just how a heat pump works and, and what it is. And hopefully it's a bit demystified. Uh, so, getting away from sort of the, the technology and into just the more fun of, of retrofitting. I really like, um, I really love what I do, honestly, because it's, it's um, it involves thinking creatively. And I really believe that every home, well, you, I see this, every home is unique and different. Every homeowner has different needs and wants and comes at it with, uh, you know, different points in their life. And um, the path to getting your home as close to net zero, as close to off of gas as possible, it looks different for everyone. However, there are there are some similarities. So um, I'm just gonna share a little bit about my own home, my own journey in the hopes that that may help educate and inspire. Um, so that's my home in the corner. We bought it about eight years ago. And at the time the windows were the original 100 year old, beautiful single pane windows that were not very comfortable so we we did replace most of them except for the two that have stained glass and our cedar siding was rotting so we um got rid of that and uh, got some vinyl siding didn't know any better but we were lucky enough to have a contractor who talked us into adding two inches of insulation which um, i feel very lucky now that i know what i do and just last year my husband and I decided this was going to be our forever home. We decided that we couldn't afford to move, although it would be nice to move closer to our kids' school. Um, but with that not being possible, it opened up the, the potential for us to invest uh, pretty heavily into getting our home off of gas and getting as close to net zero as possible. So we're kind of working in a funny, funny order, but it's the order that works for us. Our roof needed to be redone, so we had to get it reshingled, and it, two thirds of it is flat, so we added insulation. We also added insulation to the attic and um, got solar panels on. Uh, they're, they're on, they're connected to the grid, not yet. Um, we're not yet getting credits from the city. That, that'll come, I think, in the next few weeks. But that was what happened last year. And this year, with uh, three kids in our house and one bathroom, our plan is to add another bathroom in the basement. So our basement is currently unfinished, uninsulated, and we'll be adding insulation there and um, with most most often with the basement renovation involves um, 
you know, you look at the mechanicals. And so we will be getting a heat pump. So getting our heating and our hot water actually off of gas. Um, and then looking to the future uh, when hopefully the, the help loan, the zero interest help loan comes to fruition, we will be using that to help us install an uh, EV charger in the shared drive that we have and working that out with our neighbors and um, adding insulation to our main floor, which is double brick. Uh, so we'll be probably insulating from the outside since the inside of our house is 13 feet across. Um, so why become a change maker? You are probably, I'm assuming that everyone kind of who's here is you know, interested to some extent in, in retrofitting their home. And maybe you've already got an energy audit and you've thought about what you could do Maybe you've gone down a path and kind of got stuck, and um, that's not that's not uncommon. Uh, the 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 pocket change project and and becoming a change maker was something that that was thought up in order to help get people all the way to as far as they want, as far as as, as possible in their homes. And um, the I think the primary reason to become a change maker is to work alongside other people so this is michael and Lori, and um it's been amazing to work with with them and um I, every time i go to the pocket change meetings i just i see people sitting around the table sharing what they're doing asking each other questions and you know there's no better sort of teacher than your own peers who are working and, and you know working on these own pro their, these problems together um so that i would say that's the number one Reason the other is to access the the retrofit coordination service, which is the service that Paul Devset and myself provide to the change makers. Um, it's a reduced rate, and you get a generous amount of both of our time and expertise and support to help you along the way. Um, and I want to highlight that I think you know this sort of service is is really important and ideally would be provided to everyone free of charge, you know, readily accessible because, um, and I'm sure Stuart, you've seen this too across the city, when you look at people who have been able to retrofit their homes, it's people who have expertise. So I think he mentioned the person that they talked about was an engineer. I've seen like, you know, a former HVAC installer, he's done a great job at this house, but you know, he had knowledge that none of us necessarily have. Um, it's people who have more time and more resources. So it's great to see the city uh, offering their help loan uh, at zero interest and um but but yeah to to address the the time and the expertise piece the the coordination service is here to help you and make sure that you don't get stuck and you get a plan that works so michael and Lori, i hope you're okay with this i think i think so good um i just stopped by this afternoon to say hi and uh, figured that it actually might also help to understand uh, the journey that uh, that a change maker is on, and so Michael and Lori are, I would say, you know, they're they're fairly along as far as being as as far as a change maker goes. Um, they got their audit last year, and then um, quickly once the project launched, worked with Paul and I to uh, get their retrofit roadmap worked out. And I'll go into a little bit more about what that is uh, on the next slide, but essentially. It's a plan to help, it's, it's their plan of, of, of action as far as retrofitting their home. They started, so their plan involves solar panels and they've started with that. They've kind of completed step one of 10 to get those panels on their roof and connected and you know generating credits. They are seeking out quotes and we're helping them with this to add six inches of insulation to the outside of their home and replace Good portion of their windows and add an air barrier, which all of that will make their home, um, you know, incredibly comfortable and um, and efficient, and really reduce their emissions. And then they'll be able to install a heat pump that's um, a lot smaller than what they would otherwise have to install if they didn't do that insulation and air barrier and window work. Um, so the retrofit process itself is. Uh, Five steps, I suppose. So step one, you may have already started, it involves getting an energy audit. And um, this is a really great first step, even if you aren't planning to become a change maker, as Stuart mentioned, 
um, you know, you need you need an audit to qualify for the help loan to access the rebates, whether that's from the Enbridge um, Home Efficiency Program or from the Greener Homes Program. And yes, energy advisors are really booked up and busy and applying to book an audit online um, through the Greener Homes Program. Um, I, I maybe this maybe I'll get in trouble for saying this, but I don't think you should you should apply and sit back and wait to be contacted if you want an energy audit. Um, do your own research, register for the Greener Homes Program, do your own research and find an advisor that you want to hire and, and reach out to them directly uh, to book because part of the problem for, with the backlog is that there's just some glitches as far as, or maybe not glitches, it just it can take a while for the request to go from the Greener Homes Program to the organization to the energy advisor. So if you don't want to wait, just um, you know, kind of do two at once. The, the retrofit roadmap is something that um, Paul and I offer to comp, which really complements the audit. So the energy audit, as I said, it gets you set up to qualify for rebates and financing, but and gives you gives you initial an initial idea of where your home is in heat. Maybe you'll get an idea of you know um, some of the low hanging fruit that you might need to do, whether that's adding insulation to your attic or air sealing. Um, but the roadmap itself is something that uh, with, with my company, with Goldfinch Energy, we started offering these because we saw that people needed help, needed more of an action plan that helped them look at the scenarios, whether that's, you know, should I, can I get a heat pump? What if my furnace dies tomorrow? What, what, what does that look like? Or if I do have some time, you know, what, what can I do? And um, it's, it's a customized, report that really caters to you know i've worked with some people that really want to go passive house level like really intense with insulation and air sealing and then others who don't necessarily have the financial means to do all that and they they want to look at um you know high impact low cost endeavors but also want to be ready for if and when their furnace dies so um it's it's a very helpful process as well as a report that leaves you with uh with a scope as far as the the steps that you could take on your house and then the installation support is something that paul and i also offer again we've seen you know i saw this in the early days with goldfinch energy we started offering people roadmaps and got people all excited to switch to heat pumps for example and then um left them on their own and then saw with heat pumps that they ended up getting talked out of them or they ended up getting sold pieces of equipment that they didn't need or recommended that they install certain items that didn't really fit with their house. And so the installation support is something that Paul and I offer to help make sure that your plan gets translated into, into action. You know, because if you are installing a heat pump, particularly, or adding insulation to the outside of your house, to the exterior, those are two things that aren't as common, unfortunately, and so do require a little bit more oversight and um, attention to detail and, and care and selection of the right contractors who are familiar and understand the work. And, um, and so that, that's why the installation support is there. Support accessing the rebates and financing that kind of goes hand in hand with getting the energy audit. In theory, any, any energy advisor that you hire though should also be able to help you. I mean, that's, that's our job is to get you those rebates. So, um, but the financing is, is a bonus. I think that's not something that an energy advisor typically would, or would uh, provide. You. And then becoming a change maker means that there are people, Michael on this call is one of them who help. They collect baseline data on your emissions, your energy, your utility bills, and then track this and um, you know, both for your benefit, but also to help others learn from the process and the experience. This is just a bit of a snapshot of, you know, one little piece of, you know, 10 page report for one of the other change makers um, who was wondering, she has a dual fuel system and she was wondering about switching to a full uh, heat pump that would get her entirely off of gas. She's also wondering about insulating her main floor, which is double brick walls. And uh, the report also broke down, you know, what that would 
like entail and and you know if she decided to go ahead with them she'd have something she could take to contractors but um you know this sort of idea is just to give you an idea of what what kind of questions and um, information is available to help you decide what what the best course of action may be for your home whether that's now or in the future i'm almost done and then i'll leave it for questions so uh, there are a few things that I just want to share for anyone who is thinking about retrofitting their home. Um, I really believe that it's so important to learn from others. Um, that's how that's how I've seen people get inspired. I've been on many webinars where people come on and they talk about what they've done in their home and it sparks like inspiration and ideas and then other people start to do things and you know it wasn't if, if no one was talking about heat pumps I think no one would know about them so uh, you know I think that's why this the pocket change project is amazing because it is you know it's, it's conversations it's, it's it's shining a light on on this and it's a group of people who are doing it um not everyone can afford to do everything right at once right so there's some practicalities and um when your heating or air conditioner needs to be replaced it's such a shame if you end up getting stuck with another gas furnace or an air conditioner. Those are the prime opportunities to get off of gas and it is possible. I just worked with a lovely couple down the street. They bought their house um, not too long ago and installed new windows. And so they got me to do their audit and then their furnace died um, two Tuesday, yeah, two weeks ago. And Friday was gonna be minus 21. And they're like, we need to get a heat pump. We wanna get a heat pump. So we moved quickly. They got the heat pump in and operational before Friday night. It was, it was, it was very impressive how quickly they made that decision. But all that to say that uh, it is possible. It doesn't have to be something that you, uh, but anyway, it's best not to be caught off guard. So to have that plan ready so that you know if, if you know, you know the costs and you know what needs to happen uh address low hanging fruits as soon as you can so with everyone's home there are always a few low hanging fruits that you know no matter what your situation is financially are um are i think good to good to act on and things that cost little bring high return and so you will see a re reduction in your energy bills so attic insulation um air sealing and finishing the mechanical room are the top three that i see for people's homes that are you know easy to act on i also think that um with retrofitting i think you know me by me sharing my story hopefully that came up that it doesn't always have to be something where you know it happens in isolation it happens alongside other plans so you know for our home what really kicked our basement renovation into high gear was just like we really needed an extra bathroom so you know we're going to be adding insulation but also getting another bathroom and that's okay right like our homes we live in them so our our plans need to align with with what we're doing and i'm working with one couple um change makers that have that have um other ideas as well as far as maybe renovating the kitchen or adding a third floor and um you know it's, it's always fun and it's like a puzzle trying to figure out how those plans may fit into the retrofitting work as well um, but certainly if you're going to be taking off, you know, drywall or plaster on your walls, that's a prime opportunity to add some insulation, for example. Okay, I'm done. Um, I think I just threw a bunch of stuff at you. I, I'm glad there are questions because I'm curious to hear what people have to say. But if you would like to learn more about the Pocket Change Project or I guess anything that, um, yeah, anything that I may have shared as well about being a change maker, or to offer your help with this fantastic project, there's an email here. I'm not actually sure who gets that email. Maybe I do. I'm one. <laughs> and Paul Woodman, I think. Okay, great. And I will pass it back to you then, David. All righty. Well, thank you, Sarah. I love the way you did this tonight because you got me inspired. I'll be calling you in the morning. <laughs> I want to get an air source heat pump before our furnace gives out. Um, well, folks, uh, now it's your turn. Uh, and I know from the watching the, the comments, there's probably going to be a lot of questions. Now, I'm not sure how much time we have. Um, I'm happy to go for another half hour if we can, if we can do that. But uh, let's see how it goes.
Um, I, I know that there's been a few comments or questions in the chat room. Lori, maybe do you want to, are you prepared to run through those? Uh, absolutely. So we're going to go in chronological order and not surprisingly, the first ones were coming in during Stuart Dutfield's uh, presentation. So the first question was, is there any hope that new builds can access rebates for green choices, uh, heat pumps, triple glazing for windows, et cetera, so that we're promoting good choices at the beginning. And this person is asking as someone who's planning to build a home in the pocket. So Stuart. Are you available, Stuart? There, okay. Oh, I would, sorry, double muted. Uh, okay. Amateur mode. Um, so for the new builds, um, the, we don't have any grants to say right now, but I think, you know, a place to look when you're applying for permits is, you know, do consult like the Toronto Green Stand and, and, and look into that. Um, it wouldn't be surprised if there's additional things coming down the pipe, um, but at this time there aren't. Um, but, I, you know, the benefit of kind of starting from scratch in some ways is that, you know, there may be some cost savings in some ways, as opposed to retrofitting with, with it. It can be sometimes more, you know, more challenging. And you discover things under the hood, as Sarah has alluded to, and others have discovered that can make things, you know, make things expensive. Um, but um, I, I would keep waiting. I, I heard about some funding that came out today, not not for new new builds to say, but like there's a lot happening in this space. Um, there's again been a number of announcements for funding for climate initiatives or climate projects. So just keep your eyes open. Um, that would be my advice. Okay, thanks, Stuart. And before you go anywhere, another question mm -hmm. for you. Um, what alternative renewable energy sources does the City of Toronto see for existing buildings to replace gas? And part two of that is geothermal in the mix and what would be the approach in that case. And I know one of your slides did touch on geothermal. So maybe that's a question of expanding on, on something that yeah, you sure. said. So I think in terms of, um, yeah, in terms of the, you know, I think one of the most visible obviously is um, solar and it, it's a great option. It, it, it really depends on the application, right? So I would say for existing homes, solar is probably, um, I'm just make sure I'm getting this wrong. Well, it's going to be the city for all existing homes. So yeah, so I, I think it's the energy source is what we want is clean energy. So we want electricity, right? So if you're drawing off the grid, unfortunately the grid is getting dirtier, but on average the grid in Ontario is still significantly cleaner um, than um, you know provinces across the country. So I think what we, we what we need to do is again as Sarah was saying to fuel switch. So you want to get off a natural natural gas or oil, and there's, and there's not a lot of oil left, but you know move away from that. And then the the heat pump is you know really is an incredible technology. It, it's like a magic little box. Like it it, it is a magic box. Um, so you know if you're not ready, however, to you know power that or the energy source for that, you don't you're not ready to go solar just yet. You know you can get that connected. Uh, one of the considerations sometimes is you might need to upgrade the service of your home, um, but that's not always the case. But again, you know, you want to make sure you get an electrician or a, a renovator who understands that and advises you correctly. Um, the house I'm in, uh, they didn't do that. When we moved in, there were live wires everywhere. The, the, the inspector was like, just don't touch the ceiling, basically. And don't let your kids touch any pipe, right? So I think it's just really important, again, if you're going to spend money on this, you know, go for someone reputable, get your quote. Um, so I think, again, for, for homes, my perspective is solar is, is probably the most viable. Uh, geothermal, geothermal may work really well if you are starting a home from scratch and you have land that you can get a ge geothermal well into. Uh, geothermal also might work well on, on big new construction projects um, that you could also link together in some sort of district energy system. Um, to connect a whole bunch of homes together, that's complicated, right? Because you get all those homeowners to agree, you need, um, you know, often there's, you know, companies that build these energy service contracts, it's a little more complicated. Um, so I'd say if it's, if it's for a single family home, solo is probably um, your best bet. Um, but, you know, again, geothermal is great technology, 
you know, you need the land and the space, um, and it, it could work really well for some big applications. Sarah, you, you, I, you may have some thoughts on that too. That, that's just my, again, with a, with a view to the sort of single family space, that's not what, I, what I'm thinking. Yeah, related to the question around um, renewables. That, yeah, that was, uh, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I have seen like two homes that have little wind turbines. I, mm. I haven't met the homeowners though, so I don't know anything about costs return but um yeah i mean i have solar panels on my roof so i'm obviously biased but uh you know if you're going to stay in your home long term at least 10 years there's likely you know and you have a reasonable size roof it doesn't have to be huge by the way like my home is you know it's 13, 15 feet wide by like 35 feet and i've got uh 7.6 kilowatt um worth of like inverter anyway and 10 kilowatts worth of panels on my roof which is more than sufficient to cover my current consumption and my soon to be increased consumption from the heat pump and from our electric plant electric people so um yeah i think i think solar is is viable but maybe maybe there's a potential for wind i just don't know how Okay, thank you both, um, Stuart, um, in particular for, for your detailed response and Sarah for adding to that. Very straightforward question, which, which I know was um, uh, one that came up when Stuart was speaking. How is the value of a person's home assessed? Because there was that reference to, yeah. up to I think it was 10%. So Stuart, thank you. Yeah, so really quickly, uh, so what we, we use, uh, the acronym is uh, uh, the current value assessment. So that's essentially what the tax, uh, what the revenue services has a ta uh, has assessed the value of your home as for tax purposes. Um, and so, you know, what we do is that they are assessed, you know, relatively regularly. Uh, so when you, you would apply, you'd give us your address, you'd give us your tax roll number, which would come on one of your bills, and we'd send that in, and then our revenue services department would give us a bill. So say, for instance, a really easy way of doing this is, um, if it came back as 750,000 as the assessed value of your home, you could take out uh, $75,000 in, in a loan to that 10%. Uh, but now we can go higher, so up to that 125,000. But it's a, that process is really quick in terms of us uh, checking that it when, when folks apply. Okay, thanks, Stuart. Um, and I also remember a slide where there was a reference to 0% interest loans. This person is asking what would qualify you for a 0% interest uh, loan versus a, a rebate higher than that? Yeah, so um, I guess the simple way, so where we are at right now is that um, we are hoping to, we're hoping to have some rebates available through the city and obviously people can also uh, get the rebates through the feds, etc. Um, so the zero percent is going to be offered. Uh, we need to we need to finalize this agreement right now. So um, once we've secured that money, then we can use that pot of money that's loaned to us to loan to others, and that's gonna that's gonna be at zero percent. So um, you know, if people are really have a pressing project to move forward, you could move forward with it. But and if you would apply to help, you you know, we would put you on the plan that does have an interest rate. Um, so basically, what we're trying to figure out too is the challenge to mix pots of money, right? Uh, and we, we need it to be clean. So um, the, we, we basically, it's going to be very difficult for us to refinance projects that have already gone through the health process. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Sarah Grant actually asked this question, although it was a question that, that I had as well. Um, Stuart, how are you defining projects that have not yet begun? For example, does it mean windows that haven't been installed or the deposit hasn't been paid or, or at some other point in the process? Yeah, and, and you know, what I can do too is I can get some further clarification on the team for this. But what we're, based, what we're trying to say, so if, if, if the project has started through help uh, and we've, we've provided money, that's really what we're classifying as kind of started. Um, it's where, We've issued money through an existing through an existing pool of money we have, um, and I can get some. The team is actually kind of currently working on some of the specifics around the language. So, 
um, you know, we can we can follow up with you guys on that if you want. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, there, there's someone who's posed a very specific question to their particular home situation, so I'm I'm going to bypass that in the interest of time because we have a number of other questions. Um, I did appreciate the the question, uh, which I think you know everybody uh, potentially is interested in. You know, where do we get um, questions about retrofits um, addressed? And as Marco kindly said. The Pocket Change Project has such a person. That's our retrofit coach, uh, Paul Dowsett. For those of you who don't know, he is an architect, a very experienced one at that, um, whose um, firm um, has revolved around sustainable buildings. So uh, Marco also provided um, a link to reach our retrofit coach. Um, you know, in a, in a nutshell, people can ask a few questions. Um, here and there about their specific situation or, or generalities and and there's no charge for that but if people want to dig deeper um, then the hope is that they will work with paul and sarah as change makers and at least get an, an audit and a, and a roadmap done and, and there are charges um, depending on the level of uh, support that that you would like um, sarah would you like to um yes okay chime in yeah i just wanted to say too, if you're not really sure if you want to become a change maker, but you think that you would like to get some work done, um, an energy audit is also a good first step because, as Stuart mentioned, if you do the work and qualify for a rebate from the Greener Homes Program, then the bulk of the cost of the audit is covered as well. So um, make sure you hire an energy advisor. This is not a plug for me, but hire an energy advisor that's that's going to take the time though in your house and um, not just come in and out in half an hour to an hour, but is willing to talk with you uh, because it is an opportunity to get some some advice and some recommendations. So um, if you want a list of names, I can provide that. I also rec recognize there's a conflict of interest, but I'm really busy too. So I'm happy to share share the work around, but also, I love working in the pocket and live in the east end. So if you want to hire me, like that's okay too. <laughs> I just feel uncomfortable that there's a conflict of interest, so I have to share that. Yeah. So Sarah's I, very about being transparent. So at every step of the way, she says, "Now you know, uh, I recognize that blah blah blah." And and so Michael and I, as as change makers who've worked with her, we 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 always feel that the transparency is there, um, and and we never feel pressured, you know, to go with Sarah's firm or or you know someone that she's particularly familiar with if, if we have different ideas. Now, here's a, a really good question. Um, it might be coming from someone who doesn't live in the pocket. Um, she's wondering that if you want to be a change maker, do you need to live in the pocket? You want me to try and answer that question? Sure, I think you're you're you know as chair of the project. I think I think you're you know qualified to weigh in on that. I don't know whether we've had anybody approach us who's outside the pocket and would like to be a change maker. So go for it, David. Well, here's the way I will try and answer the question, and the others are welcome to chip in. I, I think right now we would have to say yes, keep it to the pocket because we're trying to. Um, to get this little project going and we're already uh, having to expand uh, to a second cohort and so forth. But our whole purpose, our whole raison d'etre really is to be able to expand this, scale it up across the city and get other neighborhoods involved. We're working very closely, not only like with Harvard Village Residents Association and, and Green Neighbors Network, they, we have, they've set up a retrofit working group and we're, we meet there uh, regularly to uh, spread the word. Um, um, the city has also had a retrofit working group and we've participated in that. So we're very anxious to scale this thing up. We would like to be able to offer a home energy retrofit service to all 421,000 homeowners across the city. And, and the nice thing about where we're doing, coming from a community-based approach, we don't have a vested interest. We're not going to profit from a, at your expense, if you understand what I mean. We're not like um, Enbridge or, or any one of those uh, big multinational companies that try to suck your blood. <laughs> We're just a nonprofit um, 
And then we want to stay a nonprofit, if you follow what I'm saying. And we work with really good people like Sarah and Paul Dowsett and others that uh, believe in what we're doing and share the mission. And uh, is there anybody else that has more to say on this from our committee? I think Eve uh, has her hand up. Good, I was looking for Eve. Hi, uh, yeah. Yeah, um, <laughs> there are a number of people from outside the pocket that have, um, have been interested in this. And I would say start with getting in touch with Paul and Sarah, because it doesn't matter whether you live in the pocket or not, that they will, will have a conversation with you and then we'll see where it goes from there. Um, the, the, the change maker from, from a formal designation um, may be harder, but in terms of the fourth, I'm sure that, that something can be worked out. Is that fair, Sarah? Yeah, I was I was just telling Leela to just email David again and ask direct. Um, because yeah, I, I think I mean you can still work with with Paul and I, it's true. And maybe it's just the mechanisms might might change, but yeah. Or the label, as you said. I don't, I don't see any other questions in the chat. Oh, somebody wants you to share the email for signing up to be a change maker. Oh. Well, and the, anyway, they're gonna keep it. I guess oh. our email address. Pocket change at the pocket.ca. Uh, Otherwise, uh, look at our website. We've got a great website. It's getting better every day, thanks to uh, Marco there. Um, uh, should we then, I think if we're done for the evening, I can say thank you to all our presenters tonight. Thank you to all of you who participated. Uh, I've found this a, a very rich experience. I've learned so much and I, and I really appreciate you all. So thank you very, very much for coming and we stay, keep in touch. Thanks, everyone. And uh, David, we'll be sure to be in touch with the pocket once we when we finally get some agreement signed, and and uh, we'll let you know. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Thanks, everyone. Presenters and presenters, Bye, much everyone. appreciated. Good evening. Good evening.